Um, let's open a word of prayer, Lord. We uh, thank you for this day. Pray that you'll bless our time together today. Pray that you'll help us to find useful information and in the things that we share today. And that we'll use those as a, a way to witness to those around us and share the gospel. Pray that you'll watch over us today in Jesus' name. Amen. So today I'm going to title this Next Move. Uh, just uh, this is sort of the grid that we use, acceleration, convergence, logistics, and understanding. Uh, and I've been over that many, many times, but things are happening very quickly. They're happening. They're accelerating. But there are some logistics things, and I think you'll see that as we talk a little bit today because there were a lot of people were telling me that they thought that what we saw going on with Israel and Iran uh, this week was, uh, well, this is Ezekiel 38 and 39. I, I just don't think we're there. I, so, But we'll know when we're there. I just don't think this is it yet. I think there's some logistical things that need to happen yet. And as we get further into this, we'll have understanding. So here's the um, sort of an operative verse that we use every week is this in Daniel chapter 12. Daniel has gotten all these prophecies, these incredible things that he's written about the scope of world history from his time to the time of the end. And he wants to know, when, when are, and he says, and I heard, but I understood not, then said I, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white and refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And it says in Daniel 11 that those wise who understand will instruct many. So we want to be in that category of people who understand what's going on because we're paying attention uh, to the things that are happening. Now, um, Another verse that we use quite a bit is that um, in Zechariah chapter 12, and I will pour on the house of David and on the habits of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for me as one grieves for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. So we see that there's going to be this great redemption of his chosen people as things uh, get closer to the end. And it also says that Jerusalem will be uh, a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. Uh, or a cup that causes reeling is, a, is the way the translation, some translations read. Uh, so we see this, that Jerusalem's going to be a cup of trembling. We also know that there are all these prophecies about the horsemen, the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls of wrath. And so the question is, you know, when, where are we on the timeline? I think we're getting closer, but I can't say that we're, we're there yet. Um, and it's interesting. I get um, a lot of email, and I don't mind people sending me email. Uh, I do not have the time to respond to much of it. I do try to read most of it, but I don't even have time to read all of it. So I apologize if you know, you're offended by that. Uh, but there are only so many hours in a day. And it's interesting because I see a lot of people who love to study Bible prophecy. And they're working things out. How is this going to happen? And the interesting thing is, I see very little agreement. <laughs> among all the emails that I get. So we'll, we'll know when it happens. Until then, we're all engaged in righteous, righteous speculation. And we need to be a little bit gracious towards others who might not, including me, who may not be fully on board with where you are, as I will try to be gracious to you since you're not fully on board with me sometimes. So we just need to be um, humble and gracious in the way we approach these things. So as I get into this uh, this week, I just want to give you a little bit of a heads up as to where um, as to where we're going to go next week. On Saturday, Olivier Melnick will be here. He'll be speaking at three o'clock here at, F at Fellowship Bible Chapel. He's going to go through the elements of the Passover Seder since this is Passover week. 
and then he'll also give another short talk on Saturday. Probably go from about 3 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. Then Sunday morning, he's going to speak first hour, as I did today. And, um, and then second hour, he and I are going to stand or sit up here and have a conversation and talk about things that are going on in the world. And Olivier is very, very good on the issue of anti-Semitism, which is something that we see uh, quite a bit. I also want to give you just a heads up. Uh, please check our YouTube channel, our Rumble channel, which is Real FBC. YouTube channel is Fellowship Bible Chapel. You can like, subscribe. I think there's a bell you're supposed to click on for notifications. And we constantly get told by people that they get unsubscribed from our channel all the time. So go back, make sure you're subscribed, click on the bell, um, and uh, that sort of thing. So uh, at least for the time being, we're gonna, we've are gonna we suspended comments just because it's hard for us as a small group to manage the comments. Um, so we're we're thinking and praying about what we're going to do with that in the future. I also did an interview this week with a, a man named uh, Dumasani Washington. I would highly recommend that you go and listen to that interview. He is uh, a very good thinker. We spoke on the issue of anti-Semitism. We spoke about concerns that we have among people that we thought would be allies with Israel in these times that are really turning against Israel. And what you're seeing is you're seeing a merger of people on the left who hate Israel and are pro-Hamas with people on the right are the same. And so Dumasani and I talked about that for about 30 minutes the other day. Uh, he's someone I would recommend that you find him on social media and follow him on Twitter. He has a habit of making very profound points, I think. He's a very wise man. And the other thing that, uh, and I talked a little bit about this last Sunday, is we're sort of seeing this merger happening in terms of political expediency, say, for example, on the issue of abortion. Now, I'm pro-life. I think I don't think abortion should be allowed. Uh, and we can argue about whether life of mother is truly in danger as to whether abortion would be appropriate at that time. Um, you know, I'm open to arguments on that very, very tiny, narrow issue. Otherwise, I think, no, it's not good. It, it damages the, uh, the culture, society. It creates a disdain for life. I think we see that playing out on our streets of our cities today in a big way. Um, so what happened in Arizona, just to recap, in Arizona they had uh, enacted during, during the period of time that Roe versus Wade was in place, it was very hard to get restrictions on abortion. So the pro-life community uh, did the best they could. They, they had to compromise, so they said, well, we'll have abortions banned after 15 weeks of pregnancy. That didn't even pass muster in some states, so sometimes they went back to 20 weeks or second, through the second trimester, people could have abortions. And there was a big fight with the Planned Parenthood types and the pro-abortion crowd that they wanted unrestricted right access to abortion, even up to the point of birth. They would do these partial birth abortions. So it, and statutes were enacted to allow that, including in Arizona, but then there was recent litigation and the Arizona Supreme Court said, well, I know what you did here, but there's this act from 1864, and since Roe versus Wade has gone away, this 1864 act is now in place. So the 1864 act pretty much bans abortions and immediately a lot of people on the right uh, Carrie Lake, who's running for Sen Senate, even President Trump. Um, and I think, I'm pretty sure Charlie Kirk. They said, we need to compromise on this because it's going, we're going to lose the election if we don't. Because the Democrats are making it a uh, penultimate uh, issue in the elections that are going on. So that's, um, that's the status of that. And so what you're seeing, though, is you're seeing people on the right who we've always thought were pro-life 
are willing to compromise on it now that they have the chance to have abortion banned in one state because they think it'll cost them the election. And maybe it will, but maybe the Lord will bless and th other things will happen. I mean, that's also possible if you take a right stand. Now, there's a recent Barna survey. So I'm going to do a little bit about cultural things and some legal lawfare type things. But, and then I'll get into it. I'm going to speak mostly about Israel and Iran uh, because that was a hot topic this week. But look at this. This is uh, from a Barna research survey. He's from Arizona Christian University, George Barna. And he surveyed predominant worldviews in America. And he's pretty good. He does pretty good surveys, uh, has good sampling techniques, that sort of thing. But sometimes his findings are very troubling. And I don't know off the top of my head what the name of the publication is, but you can find it out there. If actually, uh, if you go to Midwest Christian Outreach, uh, Don Benoit wrote an article about it or a blog post about it this week, um, comparing it to Shakespeare and Lady Macbeth and in the Macbeth play. But look at what Barna found were the predominant worldviews in America. 97% or 92%, he said, were syncretism. What's syncretism? It means you take a little bit from column A, a little bit from column B, take this from that religion, that religion, mysticism, paganism, whatever, and kind of meld it into your worldview. That's not a biblical worldview. He does a pretty good job of breaking the biblical worldview down into some simple components. So he said in America, 4% of the people have a biblical worldview. 92% are syncretism and then you see the other ones at one percent mormonism nihilism postmodernism and secular humanism but most people sort of meld things together and one of those there was a book that um, i'm going to forget his name from north carolina or notre dame wrote about he concluded that a predominant worldview in the church it's not really biblical Christianity, but it was a thing he called mor uh, moral, moralistic therapeutic deism. Which means you believe in God, but you kind of meld a lot of psychology. And, you know, as long as you're a good person, you're okay. But that's not really a biblical worldview. The biblical worldview is that you believe it, that you're a sinner. You're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. But that biblical worldview only is held by about 4%. Now, this has a practical outgoing. This is a chart from the CAS report, C-A-S-S -S report in the UK. The CAS report came out, it's kind of controversial, and said essentially, we've been failing children on the transgender issue by letting, putting too many of them on uh, puberty blockers, hormone therapy, and we don't even know the long-term results of these things. And I have to tell you, I've read some articles about what these surgeries are, and I, I don't know how to say it is, uh, if you've ever had surgery, and things don't go right with surgery, one of the problems you can have is an open wound, and it needs special care. The whole purpose of these surgeries, in many cases, is to leave people with an open wound that has to be cared for the rest of their lives as an open wound. It, the whole thing is just, it's so cruel and inhuman. And so here's what they found though. So starting back in 2009, the NHS, National Health Services in the UK, were tracking people who were referred for transgender care. And understand that the people that get referred for transgender care a lot of estimates that I've seen is that a person who gets referred to go through this transition process is going to generate over a million dollars of medical bills in their lifetime, at least a million dollars. So there's money involved, money for the drugs, money for the doctors, money for the surgeons, that type of thing. 
but what you do you see what you see here with the increase in the number of people referred there are like clusters of girls where everybody thinks they're transgender now what do you what do you call that you call it it's sort of a group hysteria that happens and look i know there are people who wrestle with this and we should pray for them god is gracious god is good god can heal people of these things but the problem is that many people in the church are capitulating to the culture they're not standing for what the bible says and that's a problem one of the places that we see is the the Obama administration this week it's funny i see more and more people referring it to as the obiden administration so um maybe i notice other people doing it for i don't remember i just remember I, the first time i mentioned it called it obiden it was a mistake it was a slip of the tongue but it kind of stuck and so i i stand by it but one of the things that the obiden administration is doing is they're changing title nine which was to prevent discrimination on the basis of sex well, they're turning the sex part into sex change. That's not what the statute intended, but just like with student loans that the Supreme Court says, Biden administration, you cannot forgive these student loans, so what does O'Biden do when he runs around the country campaigning? We're gonna forgive your student loans. And it's in the billions and billions and billions of dollars. They're just gonna forgive the loans. Even though the Supreme Court says you can't do that, you have no legislative, authority to do that and therefore you have no executive authority to do that but that doesn't make any difference to these people so harmy dillon who's a good attorney on these areas she was interviewed on a radio program the other day sort of talking about the fundamental problem with what the obiden administration is trying to do on title nine here's a clip of that this is just audio only this is audio only Let me back up. Can you get the audio? from Title IX. Title IX was okay, a... Okay, I'm going to back it up and now I'll start again. Okay, here we go. What the uh, Biden administration has done is, is eliminated the concept of biological sex from Title IX. Title IX was an important law designed to uh, protect girls and their access to sports. It has been expanded over the years as a concept to, you know, allow them uh, um, freedom from harassment and violence in educational institutions as well. And today, uh, that has been set upside down. So today, a boy under this rule who says he's a girl or a woman gets access to women's locker rooms, gets access to women's bathrooms, gets access to women's shower stalls, gets access to women's sports. And women, if they object, like most normal women will object across the political spectrum, they're the harasser. They're the ones violating the civil rights. They're the ones who will be put on trial. They're the ones who lose their freedom, their privacy, their dignity, their self-respect, because a boy says he's a woman. So biological sex is thrown out of the window. And this is a very sad day for feminism. It is a very sad day for women's rights. And she's right. I mean, it's a unbelievable thing that we see happening where it, it's, it's what you see in... Um, Isaiah, good becomes evil and evil becomes good. Everything gets turned upside down. This is something that I've mentioned a number of times about AI. And listen, I will acknowledge there are a lot of people who think AI is just a bunch of nonsense. It's not going to happen. And I think the big issue about AI is the digital, the growth of digital computer processing and lack of privacy control through the digitization of culture i believe ai is accelerating that at an incredible rate so i think it's a big deal but here's this ai boom faces global electric electricity supply hurdles these data centers there's a picture of one consume a tremendous amount of electricity so much so that 
AI companies is they're setting up data centers and processing centers. They're looking for places where there's extra capacity in the electric grid. You've seen in the UK, for example, you've seen a destruction of a large portion of the electrical grid. They've actually blown up coal burning power plants while China's building opening one or two a week on average one or two new power plants a week because they see the need for more power. And as their culture becomes more affluent, you do things that need electricity. So you want, you need more power. So how do you get more power? You get more power plants. But in the UK, for example, and then in Europe, and even here in the United States, everybody think it's gonna come from wind and solar. But you need a continuous baseload of electricity to protect the grid. And you can't do that through these, re what they call renewables. It's, it's absolute insanity. And so the people think they're gonna do this thing through net zeros. And so what you see is you see this incredible need for power as the world becomes more and more digital. As this article says, electricity consumed by data centers globally will more than double by 2026 to more than 1,000 terawatt hours, an amount roughly equivalent to Japan's annual co consumption. That's two years it's going to double. And uh, eventually I'll get back to some AI things with uh, Jason Wang, a founder of NVIDIA, who is speaking at a conference telling about how these things have, uh, the chip powers have increased. And so in a, a 10 year period, they're looking at chip power increasing by a thousand times over what it was. And that's before we even get to quantum computing. And when we get there, everything's going to radically change. There, despite um, things like reason and sanity, this is an article from the Wall Street Journal, scientists resort to once unthinkable solutions to cool the planet. Now I saw a scientist speaking the other day and his view was that CO2 is actually a pretty good thing. That if you have more CO2, you'll have more plants, you have more plants, you have more vegetation, the plants will be able to help cool the planet. So see, because CO2 is plant food, it's not a toxic substance. But these lunatics run around saying that it is, and so now you have people, that had an article from the New York Times big article a week or two ago, talk about how they're shooting things in the atmosphere to try to reflect sunlight to cool the planet. And people like Bill Gates are running around trying to do this, but at the same time, Bill Gates is building, not too far from here, like a 4,500 acre solar panel farm out in Madison County, you know, just west, just west of uh, Columbus. And what's he gonna do with all that? Microsoft is running around, they're trying to find more power. They're doing machine AI learning analysis of regulatory documents so that they can uh, cut the red tape so they can build small nuclear power plants with their data centers. And I'm not against nuclear power. I'm just saying is that they're using AI to go through and say, how can we, uh, make uh, how can we make the process more efficient and more time sensitive instead of paying a bunch of law lawyers to do that and we don't like that we don't like that at the Haller house where the people are not paying lawyers a lot of money to do things but this is by the way ai is coming i get ads all the time for different types of ai products to help you do contracts and that sort of thing so this is another interesting article. Massive U.S. deficit poses significant risk to world economy, warns the Inter International Monetary Fund. And so what did we do yesterday? We you know, put in this big bill to give, I don't know, was it $100 billion or close to $100 billion to Ukraine, Israel, and some other countries uh, to help them out. Like we have all that extra money laying around. And eventually this thing will, I guess, uh, kind of collapse. So, excuse me, I'm not sure what happened there. Did you hear that? 
Anybody wake up yet? I'm not sure. Hang on a second here. Okay. The final thing is that the defense economic... The, uh, and then somebody will say, gee, John, I don't understand why you have technology problems. <laughs> okay, well, I do 180 slides. Nobody else does. So, Okay, so let's look at this. This is a... Um, I'll talk a little bit about this later because this is what's happening in Ukraine and in the Middle East right now. It's changing the face of warfare. We have development of drones inexpensive drones that can only right now be shot down with very expensive missiles. And, it, and you'll see uh, Michael Duran will talk about that in a little bit. And one of the things in Ukraine that they've done is Russia has developed what they call glide bombs. So they take a conventional bomb, but they outfit it with wings and guidance systems and that type of thing. And so what they can do is, you know, it used to be that when you drop the bomb, the bomb would fall, you know, fall to earth by gravity. Now these bombs can be guided to very precise locations and they can be released by aircraft when the aircraft are 40, 50 miles away from the target, which puts them outside the range of air defense systems. So the plane can fly in get within 50, 60 miles of the target, release the glide bomb, the glide bomb can do its damage. And you get, you get a lot more damage from a glide bomb than you will from a, a drone. The drones have you know, limited capacity. So this is changing the face of warfare, and we'll see a little bit about how that, um, uh, how this will happen. In the Financial Times article where this is discussed, it says this, uh, glide bombs are so destructive that Ukrainian analysts with Deep State, a group close to the defense ministry, have called them a weapon for which Kyiv's forces have practically no countermeasures. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kaliba told the Financial Times that his country's soldiers are being massively, and I would say even routinely attacked by guided aerial bombs that wipe out our positions. What's that mean? The soldiers get killed. The Russians have attacked Ukraine with around 3,500 such guided aerial bombs just this year, a 16-fold increase over 2023. Um, in the third week of March alone, Russia launched over 700 guided aerial bombs, President Zelensky said. They're very simple in essence, so you cannot jam them, you cannot hide from them. The only way to protect yourself from them is to shoot down the bomber that carries the bomb, but they're out there beyond the reach of your anti-aircraft systems, which causes a major problem. So this is how war is changing very, very quickly in this day and age. So let's talk a little bit about Israel and the situation between Israel and Iran. Uh, as I noted, this is the, found this great graphic, I thought that, um, so here's an article from, I think this is from the Times of London. Tehran threatens to rip up its nuclear playbook. Now, supposedly, the Ayatollah has issued a fatwa against the development of nuclear weapons. And if you think that that's actually being followed in Iran, I've got some beachfront property in the middle of the Iranian desert to sell you. Uh, it's, it's not happening. It's happening very quickly. So this region is very, very volatile. This is the beginnings of a new graphic I'm working on, the Middle East chessboard. As we see, I'm just working on that. So last week, as we, as just before I spoke last week, Iran had attacked Israel. They attacked with about 350 uh, total uh, drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles. Now this is an IDF um, graphic, and I'm not sure that it's entirely accurate. It says 99% intercepted, but understand that about 30% of what they fired in terms of missiles didn't make it very far. They, they fell to ground and fell to earth and exploded within Iran. 
sort of like what happens sometimes at the local fireworks show on the 4th of July. Not everything gets up there and explodes in a nice, pretty way. It doesn't really go where you want it to go. And so I ran, they didn't have a very good uh, percentage. They had a much too high percentage, I think most people would say, of their stuff not working. But the stuff that got through, the drones were all shot down. Uh, they were shot down by a combination of the uh, Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, uh, and even the UK went and shot some of these down. They, they, got, they were 100 for however many, I think it was 180 drones, they shot down 180. And the drones are slow firing. It takes them, I don't know, six, seven, eight hours to get from where they're launched in Iran to get to Israel. And so understand, they, they planned this attack. They wanted the drones to get there. The cruise missiles take a couple hours and the ballistic missiles take like 12 minutes. So they wanted everything to get there at the same time. So Israel had a lot of warning. Hey, the drones are on their way. If you were following this on social media and everything, you say, hey, the drones are coming, the drones are coming, when are they gonna get there? And then there was a lot, and it was, you know, I was talking to a friend as this was going on, and it was, there were a lot of explosions in the sky because the missiles and drones were being shot down. Now, the estimates I've seen today that 75% of them were shot down by Israel, and then the other air forces or defense systems of Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the US, and the UK, they, um, they shot down the rest. And by the way, the UK has bases from the old British Empire days on Cyprus. They're like enclaves on Cyprus that are sovereign British territory, and that's where their aircraft came from that were used to shoot these down. The drones were all shot down before they crossed the border into Israel. Uh, some of them made it into Israel and fell. This is a picture of a guy standing next to a missile at the Dead Sea. Uh, and there were a number of these that fell in Israel. So that's a big missile, as you can see. That's, that's gonna cause a lot of damage. There was one, the only person injured was a young Arab girl uh, who's in critical condition, I heard, fighting for her life as these missiles fell. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna kind of go through some of the analysis of, of what this meant and Israel's response. Israel did respond um, the other day. And, and just sort of the, what does this mean? Because this was, this was different. This is the first time in recent centuries that Persia, Iran, had attacked Israel territory directly. Now, they were not successful. And it's interesting to watch the spin that's been put on this by all these different people. And even within Israel, you know, here's one from the Jerusalem Post, IDF sets response to Iran, but not its timing. They had a bunch of meetings in Israel and the war cabinet said, we're gonna respond to this sometime. Just like when Israel took out the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard people at that building in Damascus, and I don't think it was an embassy, it wasn't a consulate, it was really sort of a military building where they're doing military planning, that's all they were doing there. They took that out, <laughs> and everybody knew Iran would respond in some way. People didn't know how Iran would respond. So that went from uh, April 1st when Israel took out that building, Iran never sent anything until April 13th, Saturday evening the 13th. And so here in Haaretz, which is opposed to the government that's in place, Israel miscalculated once with Iran, will do so again in its next move. So everybody's like got an opinion about how things are supposed to happen. At the same time, all as this is going on while Israel's trying to decide to respond, Hezbollah keeps firing rockets, mortars into northern Israel. And part of that is to continue to be a disruptive force within Israel. Know that 60,000 people roughly from northern Israel have evacuated their homes. Whole towns and villages are completely empty of people. 
And they did this because if, if, if they were there, there would be a lot more people being killed. And so I saw a video, I cannot remember where it was. I tried to find it again because I wanted to play a clip of it. Um, a defense expert, she was interviewed, and she said, you know, look, this is going to be a big problem if war cuts loose in the north. We could see 200 to 500 casualties, meaning dead people in the north, every day in Israel. That's just in Israel. Know that in Lebanon, 120,000 people have evacuated southern Lebanon. Now, I don't know how the estimates of potential casualties relates to the fact that they've already evacuated all of these people. But at the interview I did with um, Avraham Levine of Alma Research, I asked him, what happens if this war in the north breaks loose with Lebanon, Hezbollah? And he said, his estimate was no Israeli child will go to school for a year because it will be that disruptive. So right now, everything seems to be pretty normal. I was talking to somebody in Jerusalem Friday, you know, people walking around, going to the restaurants, getting ready for Shabbat, getting ready for Passover, which I think is tomorrow. Life was pretty normal, but it can change very, very quickly. Uh, so here's an article in Haaretz, which is talking about, for example, the Red Sea. There's this Iranian boat that's been down there hanging around for about three years. It's finally left. Is, so that's sort of a good outcome from Israel's response to Iran. This boat, which has been, they believe, kind of working down there for almost three years in different areas around Yemen, and guiding missiles and rockets from the Houthis into Israel and other places, it's, I think it's now disappeared from radar. So nobody knows exactly where it's going to be. Uh, but here it says here in this article in Israel Hayom, according to a Bloomberg report, Iran withdrew its spy ship from the Red Sea fearing it would be a target for an Israeli response. In the past, it was reported that the ship was used by Iranians to direct Houthi attacks on vessels in the Bab al-Mandab Straits there between um, the African continent and Yemen. So here's what happened. So Israel did respond Friday, I think it was. They sent a missile towards Ish Isfahan in Iran. It destroyed an air defense system. Now, a lot of people are like, well, I'm glad that's over. Everything's solved. Israel took out these guys. Iran responded. Israel's responded. And now it's, it's over, right? Everybody can sit back and relax. And I don't think the people are sitting back and relaxing. So here's a map. So Isfahan is in central Iran. It's probably... I'm going to guess 850 miles from Israel. And it's sort of at the limits where the planes can, they can get there, but they can't get back. They have to be refueling. So the refuelers in the air. And a lot of people, they're just not sure how Israel actually pulled off this particular response on Is Isfahan, where this nuclear facility is located for um, Iran. And here's a aerial view of it. There's an air base there. And there's some indications that there was a missile system that was in one of, one of these areas and it was taken out and destroyed. Um, remember, Isfahan is where Israel destroyed some things a while back. This is a big deal for Iran. Iran has these posters. These are like on the side of buildings in Tehran. You know, this is how we're responding to Israel. Here's another one. Here's a lady walking by one. And you see, this is Israel. This, Iran is firing its missiles. There's, there was also another picture of a guy walking by the same sign, and it said, Israel is weaker than a spider web, was the thing that was talking. So everybody, every analyst in the world is talking about, okay, what does this mean? I think that the general consensus of all the intelligence reports and analysis, analyses that I've read is that they think things have changed. Nothing will be the same, and we're entering a whole different era where it's going to be 
I don't know if it's a chess game, a 3D chess game, or a poker match. You know, it's like who's going to play the next card. So right now it seems that it's in Iran's. Uh, the the uh, baton, if you will, has been passed to Iran to respond or not. So the the attack took out a, it's believed, in a Soviet-made, a Russian-made S-300 air defense system that protected the air base there by the nuclear facility in Isfahan in Iran. That is uh, significant. I think the point of it was Israel didn't want to escalate the matter, but they felt they had to respond. So they responded. They took out this air defense system, which is an air defense system, which should be something that's used to defend against an attack from the air. But it didn't work. And so there's this belief that what Israel did was they used a, uh, a glide bomb to respond. Now, this, so there's this back and forth. So here's a Bloomberg report that the entire IGC, IRGC command wing in Syria was eliminated in the strike on April the 1st. That's a very big deal. Why all of those people are together in one place when they know that Israel attacks? So now some in Iran are saying, well, it must be the Assad regime that told people that this was happening. And you wonder, why, why haven't they taken out Nasrallah? Now, I think they probably had opportunities to take out Nasrallah in Lebanon, but they've decided that he's pretty predictable. He makes these fiery speeches every so often, gets a bunch of people. And the belief is we could manage the problem, but they also thought they could manage the problem down along with Gaza and Hamas, and that did not work out. So one of the guys they took out was a guy named Zahidi, and what's one of the, what do you notice about Zahidi? This is, this is the guy. So when people talk about Israel attacking Iran, there's a belief among some people, I think it's a fantasy, that if we attack Iran and do it hard enough, the regime will fall and we'll get a much better regime. But I don't think that's gonna happen. I think that's a, um, a pipe, it's not a fantasy, it's a pipe dream because the IRGC is likely to take control because the way Iranian society is structured is they sort of give a portfolio. It's like the mafia. They give this, they give Brooklyn to this family and Staten Island to this family and then they fight over who's gonna get the drug aspect. So the IRGC controls multi tens of billions of dollars of a fortune to fund its operations, and they're committed to what they're doing. They're not doing it for the money. Khamenei has estimated the Ayatollah to control a fortune of about $100 billion, which would make him one of the richest people on the planet. But my understanding is he lives very modestly because he's committed to his radical Islamic ideas, and that is focused on destroying Israel. Same with the IRGC. So what do you notice about Zahidi that is, I think, kind of predominant when you look at him as to what his ideology is? And then they, you say, how can you figure that out? But look at his forehead. He's got the prayer bump on his forehead, which means he's a very devout, radical Muslim. And you'll see this among people. I think Hania, uh, the head of... Um, of um, the political head of Hamas, he has it, Senwar has it, uh, uh, Soleimani had it before he was killed back in the day. So that's one of the things you look at is like, who are the guys in charge? Who may come to power if these guys are gone? And they're all very radical Muslims who are committed to this religiously and, and ideologically. I thought this was a good picture of Khomeini uh, sort of the head of the snake, uh, and I just, I don't know where this was. It was, I found it in a newspaper someplace. So, Iran, this is the Tehran Times from, I think it's today, either today or yesterday. Maybe it's, I don't know, sometime in the recent few days. <laughs> and it says, Arabs in Israel after April 14. And so the way that uh, well, April 14th um, was when Iran attacked Israel. 
And so they, they're spinning everything. It's, it's all propaganda, and you have to kind of spin through. So this is a front page, Iron Lies. So the Iron Dome didn't work that well. It didn't fire things. It's not that great. Um, okay, that's what you think. So here's a, a tweet uh, from Quantum Flux. It's a thing I started looking at. So New York Times this morning, Israel strike damage Iran's aerial defenses. But Israel's not talking about it. Iran's not talking about it. So you've kind of got to piece everything together. So there's some speculation. So this guy, Jonathan Schanzer, uh, who's a defense analyst, this was his opinion as to what actually uh, happened. So here is uh, two Western officials, and I think he's one of the ones that's referred to in the New York Times article without being named, said that a missile was fired from a warplane far from Israeli or Iranian airspace and that the weapon included technology that enabled it to evade Iran's radar defenses. I think this is true. Now, was it a glide bomb or not? Was it something that was unknown? And believe me, I've seen like five different opinions just in the last two hours as to what it was. The two Iranian officials said that the military had not detected anything entering the country's airspace on Friday, including drones, missiles, or aircraft. So when the initial reports came out from Iran, they were saying, oh, this were a bunch of small drones. They were launched from within Israel, which means we have enemies living in our country that we have to go out and root out. Now they're saying, well, we didn't really detect anything. And we're, not, we're really not sure where this came from, which is actually a pretty good thing for Israel if this is exactly what happened. Because it's got to make the Iranians think, um, are they going to do this again? And will we be able to detect this happening again? So here's Jonathan Schnatzer on a little uh, webinar that he did talking about he thinks it's a glide bomb. Here's what he has to say. So now uh, people start to ask, what is going on? I've spent the, the last 12 hours or so or longer trying to figure out uh, exactly what transpired. Um, and, and what we can say is this, that the Israelis deployed a, uh, a, a new weapon, not, something that has not been seen in the Middle East up until now. Um, it is likely something that is described as a glide bomb but with a much longer distance. I think most glide bombs are believed to only have a 40 mile um, trajectory. This went apparently much further, uh, fired somewhere either in Syria or Iraq, um, completely off the radar of the Iranians. And, and really what was hit in Iran was really the most important component of this. They took out radar, apparently, um, for, on an air base, that is in charge of defending against some of Iran's most sensitive nuclear facilities. And so the Israelis essentially, the message was, we are able to hit you, you are not able to defend against us, and look at what we can hit if we wish to do so. I think the big takeaway here was that the Israelis bared their teeth at the Iranians, showed them that you know they were basically bring knives to a gunfight that the israelis have technology and abilities that the iranians didn't know and that they don't want to mess with and i think that was the the message delivered the deterrence established and now we wait and see whether the iranians have the will to try to do this again so the israelis i think at this point have to be asking themselves okay if we can prevent uh, attacks from taking place, prevent the damage. And we've got the pinpoint accuracy to be able to take out top generals, and we've got the pinpoint accuracy to take out, you know, air defenses, or radar, um, Russian-made equipment, by the way, which I'm sure the Russians can't be too pleased about. But then the question becomes, what's the Israeli strategy? Is the strategy to just keep playing defense and, and fending off these attacks? Um, or is Israel going to go on the offense? Which I think at this point, it's, it, it's glaringly apparent that the Israelis need some kind of strategy that really forces the Iranians to halt this and to begin to call back their, their proxies because this is unsustainable. And I think he's right. And, and so the question is what's gonna happen? And so I think in the, 
days, weeks, and months ahead, you're going to see this back and forth. But it, it's always on the verge of erupting into a very wide war, including a world war. So, you know, I, people that I trust, they were saying, this is it, this is World War III, this is happening. But now everything seems to have calmed down a little bit. Everybody's kind of taking a breath, but nobody knows what the next response is going to be. So there's a lot of analysts. I'm just going to refer you to a couple of articles. This is Jonathan Spire writing in Friday's Jerusalem Post. And he says, Iranian regional strategy moves forward while the West sleeps. And I think Jonathan is exactly right. He's one of the best military defense analysts on the planet, particularly on the Middle East. Uh, I think he's without peer, in my opinion. Um, and he concludes his article with this. It's possible that the befuddled West may yet act to permit this, like let permit Tehran to do these attacks every so often. The exhortations from various leaders following the April 13th attacks that Israel now seek to de-escalate would suggest that many in the West want to give the Iranians precisely what they see. In other words, they sort of have the upper hand. We'll just, well, we'll do this, we'll do this big show, and Israel will make this little tiny weak response, and everything will go on. And while all this is going on, we have our proxies doing these low-level warfare attacks, mortars, and that type of thing from um, Lebanon into northern Israel. We've got 60,000 people evacuated. It's disrupting the economy. Israel's bond ratings are going down. So we're getting a lot of bang for our buck from you know mortars and drones that really aren't that very aren't that sophisticated and they're cheap in Israel when they responded on last Saturday evening Sunday morning it cost them estimated about 1.5 billion dollars of missiles air defense missiles iron dome and that sort of thing and aircraft you know, having the fuel for having your aircraft up in the air for seven or seven or eight hours, refueling them, radar systems. That was a big deal. Uh, by the way, it's also possible that the, the air defense system in Iran that was attacked and destroyed was jammed by uh, Israel. They have this plane or planes that can go up and they can jam everything. They can make the radar systems completely blind. If you remember back, I think it was 2007. So this is 17 years ago. They had a, a plane. It was manufactured at Grumman and Long Beach and they had equipped it with radar and there was a nuclear reactor that was being built by Syria up along the Euphrates River, later in an area controlled by ISIS. So Israel decided we need to take that out. It was based on a North Korean design. It was very clear. There's videos online that sort of reenact what happened. And Israel took a couple, a few planes, I think two planes. They flew up the coast, the Mediterranean coast along Syria. They turned into Turkey. Uh, at some point dropped, they had extra fuel tanks on so they could get all the way there and back. And they dropped their bombs and destroyed this nuclear reactor. And they made it all the way up there, all the way back, and never had a shot fired at them by any of these air defense systems in all these different countries. How did they do that? Well, most people think that it was this plane is designed to jam things. And so the technology is developing even more so. In fact, there's a article, I don't remember where I saw it now. An article about the U.S. has developed a technology, I think it was in the Daily Mail, uh, according to a defense uh, analyst, that the U.S. has developed a technology where they have these bombs that will send out microwaves <laughs> that can take out the ability for a nuclear facility to function. Almost like an e a special EMP attack. So they, they could go, they could drop, and nobody gets killed and the nuclear plant is shut down for a while so they can get things back online. And it's just microwaves. I don't know if it exists or not. I'm just telling you this is what a defense analyst was saying in the Daily Mail today. So Spire's right, you should follow him. Usually writes in the Jerusalem Post on Friday, also writes at the Middle East Forum. Uh, here's another one. This is from um, Yone Jeremy Bob 
from the Jerusalem Post was strike on Isfahan, the right move. And everybody's saying, this is the right thing to do. Did we do the right thing? Should we have done something else? David Weinberg, who is a pretty good uh, defense analyst, geopolitical analyst, also a lawyer, and we love those here at Fellowship Bible Chapel. Uh, he wrote this article in the Jerusalem Post, Watershed Moments for Israel. October 7 and April 14th, demand that Israel, that Jerusalem free itself from state strategic paradigms. In other words, things have changed and we cannot do what we've always done. We have to change the way we're doing things. So he's talking about the attack that Iran launched on Israel. They didn't get anything out of it. There, there were some holes made around an air base. There was a young girl, unfortunately, who was critically injured, hit by a piece, hit by a piece of a falling missile. None of them really got anywhere and exploded. Well, maybe a couple got into that base and exploded. And so Iran says, look at the major, we had major victory. Well, they didn't have a major victory. They had a couple get through and you lost 99 out of 99%. That's pretty good. But is it? And I think that these analysts are saying, maybe it's not as good as we think because what if you're not, you're 99% this time, but what if you're only 80% the next time? A lot of people are dead. A lot of facilities are destroyed. So look at what he says. These are just some quotes from his article, David Weinberg in the Jerusalem Post on Friday. The fact that the attack failed with 50% of the missiles failing to launch or crashing before reaching their target and 49% more impressively being intercepted by Israel and its allies is irrelevant from a strategic perspective. It's kind of interesting. You would think, hey, 99%. He says this, the screeching strategic reality is that Iran has capitulated, catapulted, I'm sorry, its 40 year long war against Israel, a war that has been underway uh, via proxies ever since the Islamic Revolution in 1979 to a new stratospheric plateau, literally so, with ballistic missiles flying from Iranian soil through space to Israel. And they get there in minutes. Remember that cover of the Tehran Times that I showed you last year when they were announcing this new missile? They said 400 seconds to Jerusalem from, Is from Iran. By the way, if you divide 400 by 60 comes out to 6.66 minutes, but that's, I'm sure that's just an accident. Uh, that is why President Biden, this is David Weinberg, reported advice to Israel to take the win, as it were, to suck up its indignation, to rely on Western sanctions against Iran alone as a smart um, retaliation and to engage in, avoid, and to avoid escalation is outrageous and dangerous nonsense. Um, hang on, to... Biden has now added to the potential further collapse of any deterrence against Iran, declaring that he seeks no confrontation with Iran and will not participate in any Israeli retaliatory strike at Iran. This is strategic insanity of grandiose proportions. Exclamation point. And he's right, it's, it's insanity. And these pro-Iranian people in our government are pushing this. So um, he says this, one can be certain that Tehran can and will build more successful strike packages in the future designed to overwhelm Israel's defenses. It will try again and again, just as Hamas has launched repeated rocket wars against Israel over the past 20 years, each time with a larger number or longer range and more accurate rockets. Imagine if only one of the eight ballistic missiles out of 120 that managed to penetrate Israeli defenses last Saturday night had fallen not in and around a well-protected air base in the barren Negev, but had fallen on a high-rise building in Tel Aviv. What if that one ballistic missile had hit the nuclear reactor in Demona, which is near that air base? What if that one ballistic missile had been nuclear tipped? What if Israel had no advance notice of another such Iranian attack? And it did this, everybody was telegraphing it. By the way, there's some evidence that they told Turkey it was coming, Turkey told the United States, and the word is that the Obama administration said, okay, well, you know, go ahead, you know, just let us know when you're sending everything. That's our government. This, this is the lunatics, the pro-Iranian lunatics in charge of the federal government. 
So he says to uh, Weinberg, remember that every single warplane in the Israeli arsenal was in the air for eight straight hours this past Saturday night, along with warplanes and flying intelligence platforms from four Western air forces and reportedly several allied air, Arab air forces. By the way, Saudi Arabia shot down a couple of these. Uh, all reserve components of Israel Air Defense Array, Iron Dome, Davis Sling, Arrow 2 and Arrow 3 and the like. This is certainly not something that will necessarily be in place every time Iran decides to take a direct unannounced poke at Israel in the future. Deterrence is a tricky task, a defense and diplomatic act that is hard to achieve. It is a construct that requires constant maintenance or else it dissipates. Psychologically, deterrence is measured by subsequent behavior, meaning that the Iranian attack will be considered successful if it dissuades Israel from future attacks against Iranian leaders and assets. Very perceptive article. In general, I sense that Israel's strategic goals have become too limited in recent decades, hamstrung by the failed Oslo peace process of Palestinians and the failed Obama peace process with Iranians. And he's right. And so what's, what's coming out of Washington? Negotiate a two-state solution with the people that are trying to kill you. Give them a state. Let, let them give them a state so they can build a standing army. In, it, it's, it's crazy. It's just insane. As a result, at this very moment, Israel is being pressed by its faint-hearted friends to abandon its goal of liquidating Hamas to instead prioritize humanitarian provisions for the enemy population, to downgrade its rage over the invasion, murder, abuse, and humiliation of its citizens. By the way, do you know that the, it's pretty certain now that the 134 hostages or so that Hamas is holding that maybe only 20 of them are alive? And Hamas doesn't care. They still have 20 and they still have protests going on in Israel about it, and it could bring down the government. Um, so, let's see, uh, the last paragraph here, the Biden administration's current campaign to delay, dissuade, or eventually preclude further military conquest in Gaza and to delay, dissuade, and eventually preclude further confrontation with Iran, accompanied by persistent threats to deny Israel diplomatic backing and weapons if Jerusalem does not heed Washington's warnings, are formulas for grand defeat. As such, they must be resisted. He writes like a lawyer. I like that. I, you know, kind of a long, complex sentence. I uh, gotta love that. Seth Bransman, you can read his article, Region of the Crossroads with the Iran Attack. Also, this editorial from the Wall Street Journal. Iran's threat emerges into daylight. It's a big problem. Richard Kemp wrote in the Daily Mail the other day before Iran, Israel had responded to the Iran attack. Uh, he says this is Iran's fatal weakness, but it's also showing fatal weaknesses on the part of Israel that need to be addressed. So, well, I'll conclude with something here in just a minute, but this is from uh, the Jordanian al Ghad newspaper. This sort of shows the relative strengths of uh, Israel, military, air force, bombs, missiles versus Iran. Kind of sobering. I mean, for example, you see, uh, I re and, but you don't know how much of the Iranian stuff works. That's the problem. It might be junk. But, you know, 587,000 estimated in a standing army versus 169,000. But Israel can bring in a lot of reserves. Israel probably has a superiority in aircraft. They have a bunch of F-35s, F-16s, F-14s. And the Iranian stuff is really getting pretty old. There's some submarines, there's also missiles, and Iran has the upper hand there. So that it's not, it's not a slam dunk by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Wall Street Journal yesterday, Iran's nuclear calculus has now become more dangerous because Iran's probably trying to get to where they have a nuclear weapon if they don't have it already. It's a big problem. Now I'm gonna, look at just a couple more things. I've got a clip of Michael Doria that's about four minutes long, and then maybe I'll tie this up with a scripture reference that I thought somebody brought up, a Jewish rabbi brought up, that I thought was pretty thoughtful, using scripture. Who would have imagined, right? <laughs> it happened. So Rand is trying to do this to break out. But one of the things, and this is an article from the media line that was published in the Jerusalem Post uh, Friday, 
from Russia with influence. Historic Iran-based confrontation, Iran-Israel confrontation reveals deepening Russian-Iranian ties. And so that's where we kind of get into this Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 38, 39 thing. Russia's involved. How involved, we don't know. They they put a couple police posts in the Golan that they didn't have until recently, but they don't have a huge military pre, um, presence. So here's one of the analysts that Media Line interviewed, and he said this, Russia is now asking both sides to exercise restraint as if it has always been a peace-loving nation, he said sarcastically. Another one said, it is a standard hypocritical position that has not changed since the times of the USR and the Cold War. Um, if you go and watch the interview I did with Dumasani Washington, he reiterated what we've tried to convey here is that the whole Palestinian thing was created by the Soviet Union back in the 60s. That's when they became known as the Palestinians. That was a Russian KGB operation to, to change the way people think. And by the way, has it been successful? 60 years later, does it look like a lot of the world said, hey, give them a state? That's no problem. Um, so it, it says, you know, this may be to get people, Russia's being involved more. They seem to be exercising influence. The Institute for the Study of War has a paper out, Why You Can't Be an Iran Hawk and a Russian Dove, and I think it's a pretty good analysis. You know, so look at some of the points they make here. And we, look, we can argue about whether the Institute for Study of War is a deep state operation or anything like that, but I think their analysis here is pretty good. A Russian victory is an Iranian victory. In, in Ukraine, Moscow and Tehran have formed a military bloc with the aim of defeating the United States and its allies in the Middle East, Europe, and around the world. I think that's 100% true. The Russo-Iranian military coalition was formed in 2015 when Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Force Commander Major General Qasem Soleimani, who has, has uh, uh, assumed uh, a very high temperature on his way out, went to Moscow to seek help in keeping Bashar al-Assad in power in Syria. Why did Iran want to do that? They wanted Russia to come in and help them because they wanted to use Syria as a base for their proxies to cause trouble for Israel. Um, Russia's Iranian military cooperation has expanded dramatically since Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And you can see the people, they have these meanings. I mean, here's a Wall Street Journal article that talks about uh, Russia weapons help Iran harden defenses against Israeli airstrike. And Iran's getting, or Russia's getting drones to use in the war in Ukraine from Iran. So it's kind of a um, thing. So it says here, Russo, uh, Russian Iranian military collaboration very likely shaped the design of Iran's failed April 13, 2024, drone missile strike on Israel. Since the combination of drones, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles Iran used mirrored packages that the Russians have developed to penetrate US and NATO provided missile defenses in Ukraine. I think it's a very important thing. The Russians have moreover just demonstrated in Ukraine that repeated attempts to find vulnerabilities in missile defense systems can ultimately succeed and has shown that they are willing to share their insights with Iran. So this is, this is the issue. It worked this time, but will it work the next time? And what does, I, what does, um, what are they gonna do? Um, here is Michael Duran. You might wanna turn the sound on in this because I think the sound is a little bit, Michael Duran and Gaddy Taub talking about the Iran strike and what does it really mean and what are some things we need to be careful of? And I think, Michael Duran, who was with the Hudson Institute, uh, has this to say. The final thing is that the defense economics are really lopsided. So the Israelis spent on Saturday night $1.5 billion. The Iranians can launch uh, uh, missiles, drones, and ballistic missiles at this tempo for weeks. They have a huge stockpile of these things. They can, they, can, they can continue to supply the Russians for their activities in Ukraine, and they can launch these at the Israelis for a very long time. Uh, and the, so the Israelis will have to spend $1.5 billion a night. It's not long before that turns out to be real money. 
and, uh, um, and it's not long before the Israelis will be out of interceptors because they don't have the, they don't have the defense industrial base to keep up with it. Because this is what we've been talking about, Gadi. This is an offense dominant military regime. It's one, it's a regime that favors a balance of power that favors offensive action by the Iranians. You cannot, listen to me, this is defense science. You cannot counter an offense dominant regime with purely defensive measures, which is what the Americans are arguing you can do. You can't do it. It's basic science. So, uh, the, the, but the other since thing this is, is so crucial, and I've heard it from you, Mike, since this is so crucial, a few sentences ex explains, ex explain this, this phrase to those who haven't heard you in it yet. So, Gandhi, you have a Kevlar vest and I have a pistol. Your Kevlar vest costs $200. I shoot my six rounds into your Kevlar vest. Your Kevlar vest stops five of them. One of them gets through. Your Kevlar vest operated be above the spec. It did better than it was supposed to by stopping all five bullets. It's a fantastic Kevlar vest. The problem is you're dead because one of my bullets got through. If the, if, the, if, the, if the Iranians don't telegraph their punches, throw everything they've got at the Israelis, and keep throwing everything they've got at the Israelis, some of these ballistic missiles are going to get through sooner or later, and there's going to be a lot of damage. That's it. That's number one. But number two, your Kevlar vest costs $2,000. Each one of my bullet costs, bullets costs $2. So it costs me $12 to shoot, and I ruin your $2,000 Kevlar, uh, uh, Kevlar vest. The defense economics don't work. And sooner or later, you're going you're gonna to be hurt by what I'm, what I'm doing. We had a great night on Saturday night. The, the Iranians are, are shooting, the Russians are shooting Iranian drones in Ukraine. The first time, the, uh, the first time, the, uh, the first, when the, when, the, when the Russians first began shooting Shahids at the, uh, um, at the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians had a 90% or 95% interception rate. Today, they have an 80% interception rate because the, you, because the Russians and the Iranians with each one of these attempts is gathering intel, as you said, and they're getting better and better. Here's something else to consider. The, the, uh, today, in, you know, there's, um, uh, missile defense assets are not unlimited. They're very limited. Uh, and so Ukraine has to decide where to where to deploy its missile defense assets and it has moved them to protect its major population centers like the capital Kiev and the uh, and as a result they don't have enough to cover the troops on the front line so the troops are exposed because they're using their missile defense to to uh, to protect the uh, to, uh, to protect the um, to protect the uh, population, population. And uh, the next time, you know, the Iranians might decide to attack Americans and Israel at the same time. Do, do, do the US, does the U.S. have enough missile defense assets to protect all its bases in the Middle East? I don't think so. I don't think so at all. So they, if everything is concentrated on Israel, what's, what's left open? The, Israelis, the Iranians are studying this. They're studying all of it. There's got to be another round because they, they took no punishment for what they did here. The, this great humiliation of having all of their uh, uh, of all having all of their missiles and drones shot down, give them, gave them a lot of information so that next time that won't uh, uh, that 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 won't be the case. So you don't see them uh, uh, saying this is enough. You don't see them thinking uh, we've we've made the point, we've changed the rules, and now we don't need to go any when, further. When when has that ever been true of the Iranians? When have they ever said, okay, we made our point, we're going to go home and have peace now? When? No, no, no not, not have peace, but just wait for the other side to make a mistake, because what is true of the Iranians is that they are far, far more sophisticated than any of the other players in the scene. They're the most sophisticated in these matters. They are the most sophisticated players uh, in the uh, in the world, maybe, but certainly in the Middle East, they're more they're more sophisticated than we are. They're more sophisticated than the Israelis, even. It's uh, the Israelis. Uh, the Israelis used to be a lot smarter about these things. No, I think, yeah, yeah. When you said even, it, it just it, it was a uh, it, it 
in Hebrew we say tzavat li balev. It was it pricked me because yeah. because we're no longer sophisticated. You're gonna get. You're I, gonna, I don't know. I don't know if you know, but 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 Akiva Bigman on, on the Mida website exposed a document by Hertia Levi about how great our protection from Gaza against Gaza is, and you read it. It's a it's a Boy Scout document with with with, with no substance and no sophistication. And he's right. So let me just talk a little bit about what is Iran doing? Iran's operating on many levels. Michael Duran, Duran is, is ex exactly right. Iran is very sophisticated in these things. They've been at it for a long time. And it's hard. Um, what's the saying in the Bible? His heart is turned continually to evil. This is the Iranian regime. They think about this stuff all the time. So here is a tweet. This is from an Iranian guy, uh, Vahid Beheshti. Now, I would recommend go to JNS YouTube channel, watch the 45-minute interview that Caroline Glick did with him Thursday or Friday. It's excellent. Uh, it gives you a lot of information. And why is he important? Here's what his tweet the other day said. The leaked top secret letter of the intelligence organization of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Well, what did this document say? April 15th, the launching of an economic blockade across four continents in solidarity with the Palestinians. And so it talked about, you know, he released this letter. You can see the, uh, this is the English translation of it. It's in Farsi. And what you saw, remember the, the blockades that happened at the Golden Gate Bridge and other places? This was probably an Iranian inspired or directed operation. And we have people in our country who went along with it. And these protests are crazy. I'm just gonna play you a couple clips of protests. One is a cop confronting a Jewish man at a protest in London. Look at this, this is just insane. The guy goes down to the Hamas protest. It's clear that he's Jewish. So. People are telling him he needs to be killed, and so here's the cop response. You are quite openly, You're quite openly Jewish. This is a pro-Palestinian march. I'm not accusing you of anything, but I'm worried about the reaction. You will be escorted out of this area, so you can go about your business, go where you want freely, or if you choose to remain here because you are causing a breach of the peace with all these other people, you will be arrested. So they're going to beat you up, but we're going to arrest you because you're provocative. Columbia University is having these massive protests in New York City. And, uh, and by the way, I think I edited any bad words out of this, but here's somebody in New York City protesting. Listen to what they say. This one might be kind of loud. Yo, remember, you fucking piece of shit. Hey, remember the 7th of October. Never that forget the 7th of October. That will happen. Never forget the 7th of October. One more time. Not five more times. Not ten more times. Not a hundred more times. Not a thousand more times. Yes, but ten thousand yes, times. times. So we're going to do what Hamas did, not 10 times, not 100 times, but 1,000 times or 10,000 times to you. It's, it's crazy. Here's a tweet from Open Source's Intel, al Um This is what they're saying in New York at Columbia University. You know, the great prestigious Ivy League. You make us proud, take another soldier out. We say justice, you say how, burn Tel Aviv to the ground. Hamas, we love you, we support your rockets too. This tweet says, if Americans don't properly quell these absurd Hamas rallies at Columbia University, we can safely assume they'll take it as a proof of concept and will witness every woke university across the U.S. being shut down due to these protests. Columbia shut down. It's uh, crazy. This is a picture of a, uh, in Pomona, New York, a Chabad syn synagogue that was set on fire in the early hours of Wednesday. Now, I'm not sure that that's true. Gaddy Taub, who was in the interview with Mike, um, Michael Duran, says this, the Hamas Iranian doctrine of victory over Zionists rests on the idea of multi-arena exhaustion and on the assumption that Israeli society will not withstand it. And so he did an interview with this guy. I don't know if there's an English translation that's up, but this is what they're doing. This is the multi-level warfare that they're engaged in. So what happens if the war breaks out in the north, interview analysis I saw it was, 200 to 500 dead Israelis, every day for weeks. 
the North shut down even more than it is right now. People's lives totally disrupted because you saw what happened when they launched 300 drones, missiles, cruise missiles, and ballistic missiles. Hamas is estimated they can fire 5,000 rockets a day and they have 200,000 in their arsenal. What's gonna happen if that happens? I'm just telling you is, I think a lot of this has very significant prophetic, it's very significant prophetically. Um, this came out of Washington. U.S. reportedly intends to sanction an IDF unit it's made up of what? Orthodox Jewish people, settlers, and they're bad. And look, all these military units will have problems from time to time. This was dealt with, but now our government has said to Israel, we're going to, at least this is the indication, they're going to sanction this IDF unit. Cut off their funding, cut off any you know, funds that would come from the United States to help them defend things. This was reported by... Uh, Richard Goldberg and JNS and a number of other organizations. And then this part of Richard Goldberg's tweet, a report today suggests that Secretary Blinken is preparing to cross the Rubicon of political warfare against Israel in a way that not only delegitimizes a close democratic ally in wartime, but also puts American service members at grave risk. Senators should elevate this to the president right now before the supplemental has passed the Senate and get a firm commitment that such a morally bankrupt and irresponsible action will not occur. Based on the leaks for months, we are well aware of this virulent anti-Israel sentiment inside the State Department, including clearly paid Iranian operatives operating in the Defense Department and defense establishment in our government. It's, it's absolutely insane. Um, this is an article in Israel Hayom. Fire and maneuver, Gaza needs to be shaken again. Big article of the New York Times opinion this week is about uh, how does this, you know, this is Biden's problem now, and then an editorial in the Jerusalem Post, an op-ed, the day after Hamas conflict finishes, looking dark for Israel and Gaza. Look at how this uh, concludes. Uh, to the end. It says here, um, one analyst said this, I think Israelis are looking at a future that is dark, not grinding on a daily basis, but just dark. It will leave a lot of people pessimistic about the society's long-term future. It's psychological warfare. That's what we need to understand. So, I mean, what do we do? I mean, do we just let it go? Or do we? is there some kind of way... Uh, that people can respond. By the way, while this is going on, in Turkey, the Turkish parliament, speech by Erdogan, it was either the Turkish parliament or Erdogan's party, shouting, death to Israel. And everybody said, oh, you know, Turkey's not as Islamic as they used to be. And who was, uh, who was Erdogan meeting with yesterday in uh, Istanbul? Hania. Ismail Haniya, the political leader of Hamas. And here it is on the front pages of the Turkish newspapers. Oh, by the way, it's interesting when they talk about this, both in Iran, in Farsi, and in Turkish, when they talk about the Palestinians, look at how it's, this is how it's spelled. Philistinaline, Philistin, Phil, Philistinians, Philistines. Hmm, that's interesting. You remember, I've showed you these pictures of, this is from uh, 2017, how Turkey, this is one of Erdogan's mouthpiece newspapers, Yenis Effect, put up this graphic, this map. There it is. And I'm telling you, aside from including Saudi Arabia and everything, that's that looks like Ezekiel 3839, right? And so I'm saying is all the Bible prophecy guys, we all run around with our little maps and everything. Just go, get, just go to Turkey and get the one, what they think. And Hania, his, he had three sons and three grandsons killed in an attack in Gaza this week. And his reaction was, may God grant the, may God smooth their way or make their way smooth. 
Regarding the resistance of the Palestinian people, this is a Turkish uh, news outlet, Hani has said that if the Zionist enemy enters into Rafah, Palestinian people will not raise the white flag. The resistance fighters in Rafah are ready to defend themselves and resist attacks. And it's going to be a problem. At the UN this week, there was a vote to create a Palestinian state. That was vetoed by the United States. And look at what happened when the Israeli ambassador was said that he's going to speak. I thank the permanent Watch observer what happens. of the observer seat of Palestine, the permanent observer of the observer seat of That's Palestine. That's the Russians for his leaving. Statement. And now They're the making a statement. The they won't even sit Israel. in the room to listen to what the Israelis have to say. Thank you, Madam and we'll President. Finish, um, Madam President. With this, this is a good article <coughs> at uh, JNS. Caution, Samson is Israel. I'm just going to pass this along. This is what, because they're taking biblical principles and they're applying them. It says this, the biblical story of Samson in Judges 6, 13 to 16. And you can go look it up. And by the way, where was Samson when all of this is taking place? In Genesis, or in, uh, in Judges uh, 16, where is he when he encounters this Delilah? He's in Gaza. And so the point that this makes, the biblical story of Samson can help us understand Israel's current situation in world politics. As a redoubtable contemporary biblical scholar, Edward Greenstein said many years ago, Samson is Israel. This is particularly apt today. The story is subtle and ironic, both in the choices made by its hero, Samson, and the various interpretations open to the reader. Samson reaches out to the surrounding peoples, even though their worldview is at odds with his own. The final act of the story centers on his relationship with Delilah. He loves her, and she uses him. Samson feels secure in her arms, even though he knows that her commitment is unreliable. And he said, this is what's going on. You're, you, you're Israel... You're, you're being seduced by these Delilahs in the world that are giving you arms and weapons and money and that type of thing, and you need to resist that. Um, you know, they say this, your enemy is willing to pull its punches so your beloved can dissuade you from confronting a nation dedicated to your destruction. Leave Hamas in place. Don't hit Hezbollah. Don't provoke regime change in Iran. Don't impede Iran's development of nuclear weapons. Just relax and tell me the secret of your formidable power. Delilah delivers Samson into the hands of his enemy, shorn of his power, blinded, and left with only his nuclear option. And when you look at, when you analyze it, it's called the Samson option. I was talking to somebody in Jerusalem the other day, and I said, before I had even seen this, I said, it seems like they're being backed, Israel's being backed into a corner. And so uh, people need to pray for their protection, uh, that the God of Israel will protect Israel, however that happens. Uh, but they also need to prepare on a, on a human level and a military level and an intelligence level and a strategic level. So it's going to be very interesting to watch what happens in the days, weeks, and months ahead. And I am out of time, and I appreciate you listening and listen. We know how this all works out. But that doesn't mean it's a pretty bumpy ride until we get there. Okay? It, it's like <laughs> bumpy ride. It's the interstate in Indiana. It's, yeah. you've been, have you noticed? It's really bumpy on the interstate in Indiana as a general rule. Uh, you get to Ohio, and Ohio is like, this is like the greatest road ever. And it's the same interstate number but it changes when you get to indiana and everybody notices it and we used to live in indiana so um but it's going to be a bumpy road it's going to be indiana for a while uh, but god's in control we know how this works out but as people of god we need to pray we need to pray for the redemption of israel the protection and redemption of israel because they go hand in hand so let's pray lord thank you so much for your word Thank you for the blessing of allowing us to live at this time. And Lord, we just pray that you will give us opportunities to share the gospel with those around us at this critical time, that this is the most important thing that we can do. Help us use the, the admonitions and, 
in things that we find in Bible prophecy to open people's eyes to the ways of the Lord and, that, and to prepare them many, mentally, physically, and spiritually for the coming King, Jesus. Pray that you bless us this week in Jesus' name. Amen.